So, I hate to come to these things because lots of times the podium's taller than I am, so I'm going to move to the side, all right? They'll say, I heard the guy, but I never saw him. And I know some of you were laughing. Jarvis laughed when they heard that I used to be a highway patrolman. Yes, five foot five guys can be highway patrolmen. But I always tell people that from the knees down, I'm a dangerous cat. So I just want you to know that, right, Lisa? So thank you for allowing me to be here. Earlier today, I heard from the earlier panel about how important it is to be uh, you know, putting folks like you all in rooms and, and allowing us to come out here and share some of the programs that are happening. I personally loved what they were talking about when it comes to cybersecurity. And so I'm gonna share with you some of the things that my office has done along with the agency to support some of the initiatives that are coming out of discussions that you all are having. And at any point, if you have an idea, and I'm not sure if you're not familiar or if you are familiar with some of our programs, uh, we have a gentleman here, Robert, uh, Andrade, who's here somewhere, I think he went to go get another box for lunch. But you all are certainly welcome to ask him about some of the programs that we have, and especially when, he, there he is, especially when it has to come with uh, some of the grants that allow us to support some of your interests when it comes to cybersecurity or things like that. Ladies and gentlemen, somebody earlier asked about being breached. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that during the pandemic, listen to this, during the pandemic, we as an agency were receiving 62 calls every second of the day. Every second of the day, we were receiving 62 calls. And that was because we were either being breached or someone wanted their PIN number or someone wanted to reset their PIN number or someone wanted to know how they could go about applying for unemployment insurance benefits, right? Because we as an agency were not designed to pay individuals that were 1099s. Our contract laborers, our Uber drivers, hairstylists, other folks like that in real estate, we did not pay 1099 unemployment insurance benefits, just W-2s. So we had to do that, and we had to do it quick. So everybody was eligible for that. One of the first things that we did do, though, is we were the first state to actually waive the work search because we knew that there were folks that needed to be at home taking care of the kids, right? We knew that. But we were also one of the first states that implemented going back to work. We stopped federal benefits. We were the first state to do that. Now, I've heard conversations earlier saying, you know, I can't get workers to come back to work because um, they're still getting uh, federal benefits. They're not. Just want you to know that. And you as employees, if someone comes to your door or your office and says, I'm looking for a job. I just need for you to sign this paper. Sign it for me so I can get a job. Tell them, I'm offering you suitable work. And if you don't come in, I'm going to report you to the Texas Workforce Commission. That way, it puts out an alert that we are making sure that you have offered them a job, and it lets us know we're not going to pay that gentleman or that young lady benefits. All right? So that's important. So I might as well make, take care of that really quick. During the pandemic, we as a whole, thanks to people like you that are in this room, were able to draw 70 companies to this great state of ours. We had people from all over the country that were, and that's the folks from the economic development team. We had folks from different parts of not only this country, but globally that were looking at coming into Texas. And why did we do that? Because we have a trained, skilled workforce. Now, one of the things that I've learned from having meetings like this, forums, is that we need to do a little bit of job, at least we did, our agency or my office, in trying to get those young kids interested in these careers. Now, five years ago, did we have computer science maintenance or did we have cybersecurity technicians as a curriculum in our school? I mean, can you, do you remember those? I mean, when I was in a CTE program, I was learning how to make a birdhouse. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the technology has changed. Many of you in this room are wearing watches where you're telling time, looking at your messages, or you're checking to see if I eat this sandwich, is it enough calories for the day? That's technology. Are we teaching our young kids right now, early on, about careers that didn't even exist five years ago, or careers that are gonna exist later on? You see, when the pandemic hit, I was a little careful about the students that I wor worked with, but I found out that when the pandemic hit, that a 16-year-old kid that worked at Taco Bell was eligible for unemployment insurance benefits. I couldn't talk to him, I talked to his mother, but he was eligible according to the Department of Labor. So then I said, now I'm in that space. Now I'm in the K through 12 space. 
And so I needed to make sure that we as an agency were going to be able to actually embed folks like you all that are in industry, like my friend here, who told me he re re was retired. I told him, no wonder he looks so happy. <laughs> this gentleman's retired, but you know what? I would hire him in a minute. And I would hire him because I would love for him to work in our school districts to provide information to our young adults before they actually write that endorsement where they're gonna go and what field they're gonna study because I don't wanna waste anyone's time. See, I have folks like him now that are embedded in the schools that come from industry that are telling our young folks, our young adults, our future workforce, these are the jobs of the future, like what you all heard here today. But these people that are in our schools maybe don't know about those occupations. How many students know about wind farm operators, technicians that fix those wind farms that we have? Or how about those individuals that we have uh, that are mechanics that are specializing in batteries, like I have a Tesla. I don't have any of those, you see? So those ideas about what are we doing to train our young adults are coming from you all. I mean, I had during the pandemic, we had funeral directors from DeSoto and Lancaster that were saying they're, you know, at UNT in that area, we have so many folks, unfortunately, that are passing away, but I don't have enough funeral home directors to take care of it. Can we train our high school kids to do that? And I thought, wow, that's interesting. And now we're working on stuff like that. That's how creative we are. Just Tuesday, we had a company that met with the governor's office and my office that were coming in out of Washington that are looking at actually implementing this competition that would allow our high school kids and our college students to actually participate in hacking. Now, I told them, I don't have a problem with you all doing programs like that, but can we not call it hacking? because I'm never gonna get away with that, and certainly I'm not gonna have a job long if that happens. But that's reality, ladies and gentlemen. Are we informing our young adults, our students, our workforce, our future workforce, about those demanding occupations? Now, I will tell you that I have made many commencement speeches around the state of Texas. I have talked in a lot of places, and I've talked at community colleges, I've talked at high schools, and I've talked to universities. And one thing that I've always stressed, and Jarvis knows this because I said this in Colleen, and Brian heard this as well, that to be successful in this great state of ours, you don't have to possess a four-year degree. And I know I'm in College Station, don't get mad at me. Now, I went to a and which is not College Station, but it's the JV team of A&M, right? I mean, in Kingsville. But how cool is that? That in this very community, I know for a fact that people like Lisa are offering credentials of value in Brownsville, Texas, at no expense to them, an idea that they had with the local region to say, because of the booming expansion of LNG and SpaceX in South Texas, let me tell you what they did. See, the folks at A&M put $10 million aside to train 10,000 certifications to the people in the community at no expense to them. How cool is that? And in cyber. How cool is that? And so the other things that we learned from A&M was something that I was amazed with. And that was that we had students here at your very own university that were engineers. How many of you graduated from engineers from A&M? There's one. But raise your hand, sir. I know you passed. You're an engineer. There's one more. There's one more. There's another one. Do you know that you have a program that people around the country want to replicate? And that there's current legislation right now as we speak that I wrote that I'm hoping that passes as a result of what I learned in College Station. And that was that we had engineers, and we have engineers as we speak right now, that during the semester break, these individuals are actually taking courses of value. So you have a civil engineer it's going through the program, or mechanical, electrical. And during the semester break, they're actually going to Texas State Technical College. And they're taking welding, machine shop, cyber in Waco. So how cool is that? Credentials of value. And so if I can't get that job working at that firm that you work at, at least I have 12 hours of cybersecurity that I can get an entry-level job at Amazon, who I met with yesterday. Because that's what they're looking for these credentials that will get you in the door and the rest is up to them. 
See, they're reinforcing that we do obviously need the four-year degrees, but to get into the door of Amazon and some of these other companies like Indeed and all those companies that you hear of, it, careers that our students want to go. I mean, everybody wants to work at Amazon. Everybody, regardless of what they do there. That's all they talk about. We can get them into those entry-level jobs. In Mission, Texas, working with the local EDC, we partnered up with them, and we had a company, Royal Technologies, that went to Mission, Texas, that makes plastic tables and plastic chairs. And they're a global company. They went to the local community and said, look, we want to invest in Texas. We want to come here, and we actually like South Texas, and we love the weather. You have rail, you have interstate, you have Mexico Cross, ports of entry, where we'll get some of our stuff at. So they asked, so they asked the local EDC guy there, what can you do for my future workforce? Like, what can you do so that we can, you can entice me to come to this great city of yours? And the EDC guy says what he's been trained to say is, hey, we can provide you tax credits, we can pay for this, we can, we can give you extra parking, and we'll give you membership to the country club. I don't even know what other incentives they throw in. But the guy said, no, that's not what I'm asking. What are you going to do for my future workforce? These kids that know nothing about furniture or advanced manufacturing or robotics. So the EDC guy comes back and says, man, that's a great question. He calls me and says, what do you think? And it just so happened that I had just met with a company, CompTIA, who offers cybersecurity certifications. So we met with him and the EDC, and he puts away $50,000. He sets it aside, and I set aside through Robert Andrade, who's here somewhere, again, maybe for another sandwich he left. <laughs> but Robert Andrade gave me $50,000, which is through the agency, and we matched them. And ladies and gentlemen, we put 40 people, two cohorts, of individuals from the local community, and they picked up four certifications in eight weeks, in an eight-week period, at no expense to them. And it was interesting because the day after they graduate, after eight weeks, last day was a Friday, Saturday, we as an agency, our local workforce solutions office had a job fair, and four of them went to go work at a bank. Somebody mentioned that earlier. And the bank offered these 18-year-old kids, did I say they were 18? 19 year old kids, offered them all positions. Four of them worked at a local bank and they're monitoring their cyber department, a newly created office. They got $50,000 check, set. they got a $5,000 signing bonus and stock in the bank. Isn't that crazy? The demand in this field? So that allowed us to kind of project another initiative that they did and that was that they were going to take every fifth grader in that town, every fifth grader they were going to take in that town, and they had this, this initiative called Code the Town. Every fifth grader in that town with that school district, their capstone project is to create an app. Can you imagine that? A fifth grader creating apps? In its first year, fifth graders in that school district created 2,600 apps. One app that caught my attention was this young kid who created an app, and it was kind of a combination of you know, GPS and Google search and all this other stuff. And I thought it was cool because at 5 o'clock, he could figure out where his parents were after they got off of work. And he'd watch them, and he said, mm, mom's going to Target again. Dad's going to the cantina. Oh, that means bar? And, that, and the guy was like, hey, pop. Mom said, you better get home. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Our fifth graders are doing that. Those are your kids. Those are your kids. And because of that, they were recognized by the White House for that. And the other thing that caught my attention is somebody said, why couldn't we continue to do that for all the kids in the state of Texas? So we as an agency have this initiative that we roll out. And some of the best teams come from Central Texas and here. And we have a robotics competition that's sponsored by FIRST Robotics. Have you all heard of that? Your high school kids are participating in that. Do you, know, do you know who came up with that? That was us. We pay for that. We, as an agency, the Texas Workforce Commission, I keep telling Larry that my father thinks that TWC stands for Time Warner Cable, but, because he tells me, how come I don't have free cable? Why would you have free cable, Dad? Can you imagine 
that we now roll out this initiative called FIRST Robotics. And it was interesting because when we were in Richardson, Texas, where this annual competition takes place, one of our local business owners says, you know, I have kids, but my kids are deaf. And they'd love to participate. So the following year, we implemented the same initiative. I asked my fellow commissioners to add $450,000 more, and we now have robotic competition for deaf students. In its first year, ladies and gentlemen, in its first year, we had 850 students from around the state that competed in a robotics competition. Isn't that amazing? Thanks to people like you who suggested that. I thought that was great. The other higher ed that I like to brag about or talk about is apprenticeship. AM knows all about it. They're cyber, they have a cyber high school students. I don't know if any of your students are involved in that, but we have high school students that are right now doing an apprenticeship cyber course at AM with Desi Holmes. Were you aware of that? That we have high school kids monitoring what's happening at the university? Isn't that great? And they're getting paid for it? That's amazing what's happening at College Station. Tell me where else in the country they're doing that. Because of you and because of forums like this, we have been able to actually in encourage people about the other college, and that is apprenticeship courses. You see, apprenticeship is a valuable, a valuable tool that I'm kind of explaining to folks that when we talk about apprenticeship, it's the other college. It's the other, it's the other way of, of looking at higher ed. Right now as we speak, we are the second state, and we're close behind California, but we are second when it comes to the number of apprentices around the country. But we are number one in creativity, and I'll share that with you. We do window glazing in Round Rock. We just had a company from California come into Huddle, and they do something with space with race cars. I'm not sure what the name of it is, but I just know that they have an apprenticeship program. Then I was at Raytheon in Collin College recently, first of its kind, and they were doing it in lasers. Isn't that cool? We got to get our young kids involved in that as well. Can't do it when they're adults. We gotta talk about pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship in high school. We gotta talk to them about the other college, ladies and gentlemen. The other college is just as valuable. So I mentioned those. And then we have apprenticeships for our registered nurses. They're already nurses, but you know what we're teaching them at St. David's? How to troubleshoot and how to use a computer. Because they're calling the IT people and saying, look, I'm here in the ICU room and I can't seem to get on. And IT people say, can you tra train them on how to use a computer? And we are, it's a one year program on our dime and the employers. We're also doing it in cyber and IT. And I know you might like this one, sir. We have a one of its kind apprenticeship program right now in Brewmaster, how to make beer. So we're taking tasters if you guys would like. I'm just kidding, everybody always wants to know where that one's at. Oh, and we're the only ones in the country, right Brian? We're the only ones in the country, did I tell you that? Did I tell you that we were the number one in all of these that I just rolled out because of folks like you all that says, is this apprenticeable? We're doing it in education now, in Brazos ISD and at Cedar Valley College, Lancaster DeSoto, my folks that I was with yesterday. We're gonna get folks that are paraprofessionals, we're gonna, they're already in class, we're gonna bump up their pay and by the way, they're getting college credit because many of those courses that they're taking are transferable right now to 35 colleges around the state and Tarleton State University. And A&M's been asking me, we want those students. We want those students right now. But the one that I'm most proud of is the one that we're super close to getting. And the eyes of the country are looking at Texas right now. We had over 100 people in healthcare professions, our local boards, our community colleges, our nonprofits, our career schools that I assembled in a room very similar to this, 100 of you. And I asked them, what is your number one need? And it was nursing, nurses. Do you know that there was a report that was submitted to the governor's office back in 2001? And the, in 2001, that report came back to higher ed and said, between now in 2032, 
I'm going to share with you a number that's going to be a little shocking. But did you know between where we're at, the day we're at today and in 2032, we're going to be short 57,000 nurses. That's a lot of nurses. Why do you think that we have this apprenticeship model that we're focusing on? Because my goal is to get that 17-year-old girl that's a medical assistant to look, work at Baylor Scott and White or any of the hospitals in this area. And once they transfer from high school graduate, that employer, Baylor Scott and White, says, you're working with us. Here's your white coat, your dentoscope, and you're working with us. And during the day that she's in class, she's getting paid. And then at night, she's going to work. Isn't that cool? Tell me who else in the country is doing that. Texas is. We're this close to getting those standards approved by the Department of Labor. And that medical assistant is going to do what Governor Abbott intended us to do in 2016, and that was to make sure that those 24 to 35 year olds were going to receive some type of credential to be self-sufficient. Industry recognized credentials, by the way, portable to any part of the state or the country. This MA now becomes an LBN on the hospital's diamond, and, and of course, with a little help from us, that LVN becomes an RN, RN becomes a BSN. And this whole time working for the same hospital. How cool is that? See, I'm not waiting for this student to graduate from college and say, okay, I'm looking for a job now. No, we want to hire them early. And we're doing that in every industry. At SpaceX right now as we speak, we're training their engineers to be welders. They're civil, mechanical, and electrical engineers to be welders. Isn't that interesting? We're going back to the trades. Remember I talked earlier about that birdhouse? Shame on schools that we're still building birdhouses. We should be doing highly advanced technology. We are, thanks to our great CTE partners around the state of Texas. Have you noticed that's all you talk about now? CTE, apprenticeship, career and technology, as I referenced. Those are the buzzwords. Ladies and gentlemen, as we speak, again, Higher ed is changing every day. Look, I can go on and on about the great things that we as an agency are doing, but all the initiatives that I referenced to you just now all came from forums like what's being put on today where people said, have you ever thought about what we could do for people with a disability? Do you know that we're training folks at CBS Pharmacy right now to be pharmacy technicians, that may not sound like a big deal, but did you know that everybody that's in that class is blind? And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I've been to a CVS pharmacy. I've never seen a blind folk, a person behind the register. Next time you call that 1-800 number, on our dime, we help them with braille books, a computer. We actually kind of did some modifications at their house so that these people could work from the convenience of their home. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the unemployment rate as we are continuing to you know, experience what we did with this pandemic, we're continuing to improve almost to pre-pandemic level. Our unemployment rate is 4.0. We were 3.7 thanks to these fine gentlemen and folks like you all that were hiring everybody, but we have more folks, I should say, we have more job openings than we have people. So I'm going to end with one more group of folks that I am very passionate about. And that is those individuals that have been touched by the justice system. You know, we have a lot of folks, and many of we, we know a lot of folks that have been in, incarcerated, or we know someone who has been or someone who is currently incarcerated. So when employers come to me that say, I don't have enough folks that want to be mechanics at my shop. So we get Robert Andrade, who's back from his lunch break, and he meets with Jim Tipton out of Brownsville, Texas, one of the largest car dealerships in the Valley. And he says, where am I going to get skilled workers? And I, we go to him and ask him, would you be willing to hire somebody who's been formerly incarcerated? Heck yeah. What are they going to do for me? Let's train them at the local college to be mechanics. To this day, ladies and gentlemen, those people make over 80000 He hired four of them. And he was so impressed with those four, he said, do you have another one that graduated from Penn State? And I thought, Penn State? The pen, sir. The pen. They graduated from the pen. <laughs> Took me a while to get that, too, you see. I said, we do. They hired him. 
That gentleman last year made $189,000 as a car salesman. And they gave him a Rolex watch for Christmas last year. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what's happening right now. Why do you think that people are coming to this great state of ours? Because we have economic development partners like them and, and business partners that we're listening to. See, we were charged to do that. That's why we put these on, because you're telling us what to do. So you're my boss. I was appointed by Governor Abbott, but you're my boss. You tell me what to do. So those individuals that have been formerly incarcerated, unfortunately, when I've gone to many prisons and I've asked each one of those inmates, what is it you want when you re get released? You want to go to have a nice meal? You want to go have a drink at the bar? Commissioner, I want a job. And thank you. We provide them with fidelity bonding, these individuals, and we're providing them with tax credits to the employers as we do our military servicemen, people with disability, and our foster youth. And I could go on, but I, I don't have that much time. But all these individuals right here need our help. And we provide incentives so that we can hire all of them. So again, thank you for allowing me the, I was only supposed to speak five minutes, I think. But I, I'm so passionate about this group, you can see. And shame on us if we're not out there conveying this message to you. And I'm not talking about, I'm talking about my office. If we need to be out there, you got Robert Andrade here, please see him. We got grant money. We got the information. We got the tools for each and one, every one of you to be successful. You see, I had those tools when I was a highway patrolman. All I needed was my gun, right? And I met my ass baton. And my hat was super high, so it made me look taller. <laughs> now, I'll leave you with this Christmas story before I leave as a highway patrolman. My last year as a highway patrolman, I remember telling my sergeant, Sarge, I want everybody who's married and has a girlfriend to stay with their family, and I'll work patrol by myself. But I'm going to make you a deal, Sarge. I'm not going to give anybody a ticket unless they're drunk or they got dope or it's something that's really bad. He said, like, you got it. At your discretion, trooper. So I'm on the expressway, and I see this car, old car, just speeding down the expressway. And I said, oh my god, great, I'm going to go get me one. So I get behind that car, and I don't see anybody driving. And I'm like, oh man, something's going on here. So I call it in. I said, I don't know if it's a male or female. Car's going about 80 and a 65. I'm going to pull it over. I called dispatch, pulled the car over. It took a while, put on my horn, my lights. Hey, lady, I'm driving a Camaro. By the way, I was the only one that could fit in it. <laughs> but I'm over there putting all this stuff on. Nobody would pull over. So I'm thinking, oh, please don't let it be a high school kid or elementary or junior high. Well, it wasn't. And it was an older car. So remember, I had the, I have the opportunity here to cite that person. But at my discretion, I walk out. And I go up to the car, and I'm looking. And it's a lady about this big. And I knock on the window. And she looks at me like I scared her. And I said, ma'am, I'm with the Texas Highway Patrol. I just wanted to let you know you were going a little quick. And she goes, after rolling down the window like this, that's how old the car was. She goes, oh, OK, I'm glad. And I, I thought maybe you were one of Santa's elves after me. <laughs> so I turned my ticket book and gave her a ticket. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I didn't do that. Merry Christmas to all of you. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for what you do for this great state. Best place to live. Best place to do business. And of course, I agree. God is good. And I wish you all a Merry Christmas. Thank you.